introduce Vice President Genome and Company, So Young Jin, who will be talking about the growth strategy for biotech. Good afternoon. My name is Young Jin from Genome and Company. I'd like to thank the organizer for inviting me and congratulations on having this conference. And today I'm going to talk about the strategies for biotech who wants to uh, go on the stock exchange market. And let me introduce myself to you. I graduated from Korea University and got the master's degree for management from Duke University. Now I am with the Genome and Company. These are the topics of my presentation. I'm going to talk about the growth strategy for biotech. That's my main thing. This is the first slide, and I believe that those people in the IT, in the IT industry will understand how come I have this picture on this slide. We are at war and trying to come up with new ideas, and we have weapons of technologies to be the winner in this world, and how we can implement our businesses. We have to adopt a value chain research and commercialization as part of the value chain. And I'm going to talk about three approaches, and disease, technology, and value chains are the perspective that help us to see the biotech was how it will unfold in the future. And this is, I believe, that what you are familiar to. Some of the companies are focused on disease, and the other companies may focus on technology. And disease solution provider is the ones who are focused on diseases, and those ones who have a innovative technology such as Moderna and breakthrough technology led companies are called a breakthrough innovator. And as for the disease solution provider, they have an in-depth knowledge of the indications or diseases, and they conduct the clinical trials on their own. And they target the indications or diseases that are developing. And one of the representative examples are the Novana Disc and Lundback. Who, a, who has an antidepressant drugs. And breakthrough innovators are working in the disease areas that are in the infant stage. Moderna or CRISPR therapies are the examples that are developed by the breakthrough innovators. Now let me have a look at the life cycle of the disease solution provider. In the entry stage, they secure the anchor diseases or indications, and within the framework of the indications, they come up with a different products and solutions. And they can rather focus on the conditions or expand to the nearby conditions. So first, in the initial stage, in the research, they do the clinical trials and secure marketing experience. And within the condition areas, they have a collaborative relationship with the clinical trials experts and others. And in the US and European market, they have their own series organizations grown. Whereas breakthrough innovators, they may have no sales or revenues for the first 10 years, during which they focus on developing new technologies. And based on the technologies, they come up with the new products. And using the technologies, they can expand their product portfolio. So let me have a look at them phase by phase. They have the human resources who have expertise in the related areas, and then they identify the project 
for their research. And the third, they build collaborative network with the global big farmers. So these are the strategies they, that they adopt. For the research and development, the disease solution provider, and we have a breakthrough innovator, two different approaches. Uh, Genome and company have started from the point two. And now I'd like to talk about the third perspective, which is a value chain. After R&D is done, we have to adopt a model for commercialization, and this is another topic that we have to focus on. As for us, we commercialize and develop the products and launch them into the market. So commercialization is one area that we are very interested in. So for that growth strategy, we I'm going to talk about the two concepts. One is a connect and development, and second is a fully integrated biotech. So we can think of these two models. First, connect and develop model is adopted by many different domestic companies in Korea, such as Handok. And for the big opportunity market, they focus on development. And in the early stage, they license out clinical trials of phase one and two to the big pharma companies. So for those conditions that are growing very rapidly, they are focusing their efforts on. Then what is a fully integrated biotech? They focus on the commercialization, which means that Europe and the US are the main market. For the Chinese companies, China will be the main market. And they also work with the global big farmers in a selective areas. And GenMob, and GenMob is a very famous antibody company in Denmark, and Biogene is a Chinese firm. They are going a globalization process starting from China, and they started from biotech, and it has been growing very rapidly. Connect and develop model and fully integrated biotech model, they are not separately existing. At some point, they can be combined in the initial stage, in the entry stage. They may do take an approach of license in or out, and Korean biotech companies are in this stage right now. But with the accumulated skills and technology and capabilities, they will focus on a specific disease area. So they, ad they adopt or select a focus on the specific disease conditions, and then they get the license in a small molecule or jointly develop a specific product. What will be the cases or examples? Currently, I focus on GenMap. Fully integrated biotech is the mine that they adopted. They were established in 1999, and they are duly listed in NASDAQ and Copenhagen. They have four or five products which are marketed, and the revenue is this much, and the operating income is two trillion. As for the GenMap, antibody products is the main product line, which means that antibody technology is it is specialized in, and three of them are marketed in the world, and they have more than one trillion royalty income. And this is model that Korean companies try to adopt. In 2015, they adopted a vision of becoming a fully integrated biotech, and as of today, they are running phase three clinical trials 
working with Amgen. And they come up with the strategic vision to be focused on cancer, cancer or oncology. And now they develop a product or medicines that can be launched into the market. And now it has become a very profitable company. And by the year 2025, they will launch other new products and commercial unit will be established in the near future in Europe and other markets. They have a good technology and capabilities and now they are trying to have excellencies in commercialization. As I said, along with uh, since genetics, they got one molecule or a antibody product approved and another product is in the phase two and three clinical trials and now they are trying to establish a commercial unit in the US and Japan. As of 2020, total revenue and uh, profit is nearly one trillion and as shown here, FDA Abimantama is fired at the US FDA and they have two more products to be launched and once they are fully launched I believe that their revenue will be growing much bigger. I talked about the Zem case and what I wanted to say is that disease and technology are something that we can start from, but it goes beyond that. Bio venture, and for them to become a big farmer, they need to expand the value chain. That's what the case company has shown to us. And from that perspective, what about the genome and company that I'm with? What is the strategy model that we have adopted? That's what I'm going to cover now. Genome Company, as you might be aware, we are developing and producing a product based on microbiome. We have a new drug development and commissioned the production business line. And from the new product development, microbiome is an area that we are researching on and microbiome based clinical trial is underway right now and novel target discovery is what we want to do so trying to find a novel target is an area that we are working on and as for the commission the products or OEM production microbiome is not approved for or as a new product. But the production facilities are of a critical value to us. So we are having the infrastructure for the microbiome based product so that we will not suffer from any bottleneck in the production later on. So now we are launched as a bioventure where we are focusing on the new product development and the OEM production. These are the two business lines that we are operating. This is a business slide for the new product development. Microbiome may allow us to expand the indications that we can cover and for the new products we try to find or identify new targets and expand the anti-cancer therapies and for the production we want to have the capabilities for the commercial production and for the new drug development we work with the CMO and for the commercialization we jointly develop along with the global companies, but in the future, we try to have a commercialization on our own with a target for the Asian market. And as for the CDMO, 
business line for the microbiome. We have acquired the microbiome company of the US, and based on that, we try to become one of the main players for the whole microbiome industry. We have acquired a uh, US company, but we try to have a two separate business lines so that we can do run our business parallel. And for the production facilities, we will expand the production facilities to become one of the best global players in the future. So that has been our vision. I have covered our growth strategies so far, but in conclusion, uh, when, I, when, it, when it comes to the conclusion, I just wondered what will be the best way for us to conclude my presentation. I thought that growth strategy is what I can share with you so that you can have a better idea of running your company too. For the growth strategy, I believe that we need to take time to think of, to think of what growth strategy is. And there are many people from the medical centers or lab so that they can launch a business and run their own business. So whenever you try to run a new business, you have to think of the growth strategy, which cover how you market your product into the market. And second, no matter what approaches that you have to, that you take, you need to explore the growth type, which is called a big picture. When I ran a project in vain, I learned the lesson that no company aimed at technology transfer. That's one of the tools or part of the processes. The ultimate target of almost all companies is to commercialize their products and on a big money. So in order to achieve that, you have to draw the picture of your company over the period of 10 years. And once you have identified your growth type, you have to think of your value chain and expand it. What you believe is important for your business should be reflected in the value chain. And as a person with a biotech company, there are companies who neglect to draw a long-term picture because you have to tackle day-to-day -day businesses all the time. But I believe that in order to survive in, in the market, it's better for you to think of your company and draw the big picture on a long-term basis. So by doing so, I believe that there will be many Korean companies who will be grow to become a global big pharma. Thank you. This concludes my presentation. 네, 오후 프로그램 그 시작 열어주신 진홈의 컴퍼니 사용진 부사장님께 감사드리고요. Thank you very much. Uh, EBP 용진서 of Genome and Company. Uh, thank you for the presentation on the topic of the growth strategy of the biotech. You open the afternoon session in a very, very vibrant way. Uh, the second session uh, is on the topic of successful digital transformation strategy in biopharma industry. And now I would like to introduce the second presenter, uh, Professor uh, Art Cho uh, from Korea University. He is also a founder and CEO of Cerebro, who develops uh, anti-cancer drugs. Uh, he will talk about computational drug discovery, past, present, and the future. Um, <clears throat> when, I, when I was first asked to give this talk, I, you know, I thought it was an international conference, so I prepared my talk in English. So I'm going to speak in English from now on. So my name is Art Cho. Uh, I'm from Korea University, and I also run this uh, you know, startup company called InCerebro. So I'm going to be talking about the history of computational drug discovery, which will lead to uh, the, the future outlook uh, of the field. 
So I want to start uh, by posing a question. Okay, so um, uh, how many of you have heard of this term, AI drug discovery? Probably uh, a lot, right? So uh, in fact, the last 10 years or so, uh, we've been seeing the flood of this uh, uh, usage of uh, term, the AI drug discovery. And in fact, it's probably for, uh, for the entire society as a whole. You use AI, the uh, artificial intelligence. But what is artificial intelligence? It's um, you're trying to mimic, uh, using the computer, what the human brain does, right, or, or human intelligence. Uh, so, you know, it's like you, know, you have to run the computer, and in, in talking about running the computer uh, for drug discovery processes, things began much earlier. In fact, um, I, I can say uh, the serious application of computers in drug discovery started probably around 30 years ago. Uh, and so the field uh, is a much broader term than AI drug discovery, and uh, I, I call it the computational drug discovery, which is also known as uh, CAD. Uh, the, uh, it's an acronym for computer-aided drug design. And it has been conceived pretty much uh, along the same time as the, the birth of the digital computers. So that was like, um, I think the first computer called uh, ENIAC was um, the, uh, invented probably in 1948 or something like that. Um, don't quote me on that because I'm not too sure. I didn't, haven't looked up uh, my Google yet. <laughs> but uh, uh, I know uh, in 1950s we already had the uh, computers. And in fact, uh, Crick, who is the guy you probably know as one of these two people of Watson and Crick uh, duo, who got their Nobel Prize uh, back in 1962 or something like that uh, for their discovery of the DNA structure. So he wrote in his book that, okay, for uh, use the computer to simulate uh, DNA and protein binding, then we can, you know, in fact, uh, think about how uh, they develop and things like that. And he called the, these process docking. So the, the concept of docking started uh, uh, very early on. In fact, uh, uh, right at the time the digital computer was uh, being born. Now people realized that, okay, so uh, starting from the Crick's idea, uh, in fact, you can simulate the, the binding of a protein and some other compounds, which is how the drug uh, really works. So they uh, figure that the, if you use this uh, you know, process or program, that you could actually help uh, drug discovery process uh, to uh, quite a bit of extent. Well, uh, the, the idea was good, but then the problem was the computer oh, wasn't uh, just fast enough back then. So it wasn't only until 1982, a guy named uh, Owen Kunz, who is in the, uh, in the picture here, uh, from UC San Francisco, developed this program called DOC. And this uh, was the first program uh, that can be called uh, the docking program that can be used in, for the practical use. Uh, but of course, in 1980s, still uh, the computers weren't uh, fast enough. So these uh, adoption of these docking programs in the real drug discovery uh, pr uh, pr processes uh, weren't uh, immediately popular, but the, it, they slowly uh, caught on. Then by year 2000, uh, we saw a, a lot of pharmaceutical companies who would actually use these programs to uh, help their drug discovery programs, and some tangible results uh, started to emerge uh, from that point on. So uh, the docking uh, actually is a, uh, the program or the methods that can be used as a part of the larger uh, the concept, which we call a virtual screening. The virtual screening is, you know, something that you do on a computer, but it uh, uh, basically replaces the what we call a high throughput screening, which is done experimentally, uh, and 
now, nowadays, the virtual screen is a kind of de facto standard uh, that every company is trying to do this now. And it, uh, it reduced uh, the development time and cost dramatically. And over the years, there are a number of docking programs that were developed. And some notable ones is Dock on Auto Dock and uh, Golden ICM and Glide. And the first two are actually uh, the academic programs. And the latter three are commercial programs which, for which you have to pay half the sum of money uh, to use them. And uh, in fact, you know, the, the fact that they can uh, sell this for that much uh, money is a telltale sign of how uh, valuable these programs are in the pharmaceutical industry these days. Uh, what's next? Okay, here we go. Uh, there are other computational methods than uh, just docking. Uh, in fact, the, the first one I uh, listed here is uh, QSAR, uh, which is an acronym for Quantitative Structure Activity Relationship. It's uh, the most the typical one that people use. Uh, other uh, things like pharmacophore mo pharmaco modeling or similarity search uh, are actually similar in nature because they are all uh, basically what we call a data-driven discovery methods. So they rely on the data, uh, which comes from the experiments. Uh, and so you need a lot of uh, this data to um, make use of these uh, methods. And they eventually motivated the use of uh, machine learning and eventually uh, uh, artificial intelligence. So now I came to the subject of uh, AI. Well, before talking about the AI, uh, let me just tell you that uh, machine learning, uh, which I'm pretty sure uh, most of you know uh, that that's the uh, basic idea of um, uh, the AI nowadays. Uh, and that method has been used in hashtag informatics for quite a while. I call this hashtag because you, know, you can, in fact, insert any kind of uh, field in there and you will have uh, just a new field for uh, informatics. So an example would be bioinformatics or chem informatics and even social informatics and all that. And they are used, uh, I mean, the machine learning uh, is used in this field. Well, of course, the only uh, after the deep learning algorithms become popular, we really started to have uh, this word uh, used in the society, that is AI, okay? And uh, deep learning is just a uh, uh, part of uh, machine learning methods, um, but now we can equate almost that AI or with the deep learning. And, and so uh, when you talk about the uh, uh, AI drug discovery, you are probably saying that, uh, okay, you are applying the deep learning in some way uh, in drug discovery process. And uh, as I said, uh, we've been seeing uh, uh, this term, AI drug discovery, used a lot uh, over the last uh, decade. And in fact, the, one of the uh, more famous uh, AI uh, drug discovery startup uh, called Atomwise was founded in year 2012. Uh, now, at this point in time, uh, you can say uh, that AI drug discovery combined with the structure-based drug design uh, method uh, is re now recognized as an, uh, the industrial sector on its own. Well, so I uh, talked about uh, docking and use of AI in drug discovery, and really they represent these two uh, distinct schools of thought. One is deductive reasoning, and the other one is inductive reasoning. They are uh, kind of the opposite. And for deductive reasoning, I can tell you that the uh, docking uh, belongs to this um, uh, sector or the categories. Uh, and they are uh, what we call the physics-based modeling uh, methods. What we do is we use the physics uh, knowledge to uh, like make predictions by uh, running simulations and all, all things like that. So we need a very solid theoretical uh, foundation uh, to make it work. Now, on the other side of the spectrum, uh, you have inductive reasoning uh, methods, 
And that's basically what the machine learning methods are all about. So you need to have uh, uh, clean and uh, well-structured data and use them to make these methods or the computer to learn uh, what's behind uh, this data and trying to find some kind of patterns, which in case of deep learning, uh, humans will never actually uh, track down what it's all about. But they do make uh, very good uh, predictions, and therefore you can use that uh, for further development in uh, drug discovery. So uh, what does that all entail for uh, current state of uh, computational drug discovery? Uh, in order to tell you that, I just want to uh, tell you something about uh, this company called Schrodinger. Uh, the reason I uh, uh, bring this up is because, uh, for one thing, Schrodinger, I'm sure a lot of you are, uh, uh, have heard of the, the, the name of the company uh, because they uh, debuted it just, I think, uh, just about a year and a half ago uh, in NASDAQ. And immediately they became a success and uh, was hailed as um, sort of um, uh, the next Tesla uh, of NASDAQ or something like that. So a lot of people know about this company, but also personally I have worked in this company for a couple of years. And for some reason over my uh, career, I have been uh, working with the all two uh, co-founders of this company. So I know quite a, uh, a lot about it, but it all also uh, is the fact that the Schrodinger is, uh, was at the forefront of this field. So uh, looking at his, their history, you can understand how uh, this field evolved. Uh, Schrodinger actually started out as a, a quantum mechanical calculation program developer right in year 1990. So, uh, but back then, it wasn't you know um, much of a success because um, not many people would buy these programs really. So they started to uh, metamorphosize into a, a drug discovery platform developer uh, right uh, around the year 2000, and by developing their do own docking program called Glide. Uh, so they started to cater the pharmaceutical companies uh, in. Uh, supplying these programs and the platform. But in year 2009, they uh, founded this company as a spin-off called Nimbus Discovery with the money uh, or investment coming from Bill Gates. I'm sure you all know he's the founder of Microsoft. Uh, and they, uh, they, together they uh, uh, founded this company and Later, Nimbus Discovery became Nimbus Therapeutics and had a huge success in the year 2016 by licensing out their uh, drug candidate to Gilead. And it became uh, a, the, uh, such an encouraging news for this field because they, it was the first time they uh, really showed that the computational drug dis discovery can work. Um, and so uh, I would call the year 2016 as a seminal year for this field. And later, uh, I'm sure it, it was in the original plan, but that they were encouraged by uh, the success also. And they went into another metamorphosis and they became their own uh, drug discovery biotech and uh, had a successful IPO in year 2020. And that's the uh, history of Schrodinger. Now, if you look at the Schrodinger's platform, um, they will tell you right away that they are uh, uh, mainly physics-based uh, platform, meaning that they uh, use docking and all the uh, peripheral programs for that. Uh, but they also add uh, uh, AI capabilities. So it's like a combination of the two different uh, you know, methods, but the, their main stay is the physics-based method. Now, so I can tell you that uh, there are separate roles that we can uh, really assign to AI and physics-based me physics methods. Um, well, for one thing, uh, if you want to work on, uh, say, first-in-class drugs, by definition, there aren't that many data. 
Okay, so uh, uh, for these cases, you really want to uh, well start with a physics-based methods, uh, but uh, eventually, when you get to uh, the point where you have uh, you have to optimize these uh, drug candidates uh, and do something like enemy tox predictions and things like that, then the AI, because uh, because of the abundance of the data, can work really well. So I can tell you that the combination of physics-based method and AI, AI in some form uh, has already become uh, a norm. In fact, uh, if you listen to uh, you know, the talk, by, talk given by uh, Adam Wise personnel, uh, you'll notice that, that they also use docking, uh, although their main uh, methods they advertise is the using the AI uh, methods. So, um, okay, okay. Now, so those are about the past and present. So what about the future? In order to get to the future, uh, I needed to talk about the uh, difference between what's the de facto standard, which is molecular mechanics versus quantum mechanics, which is a, a little more advanced method that you can use. But I probably need a whole day to give a lecture on this, so let me just tell you that the uh, quantum mechanics which I abbreviated here as QM, is more accurate, but it takes a lot more computational time. So it's not practical to use that as a full-blown method for uh, drug discovery processes. Uh, but, you know, here and there, uh, we can apply the uh, quantum mechanics, and we see the results being more accurate and uh, quite useful. So there comes this uh, uh, subject of quantum computing. I'm a, uh, again, sure that uh, a lot of you heard of this, um, you know, uh, upcoming uh, technology called quantum computing, and it's hailed as a dream technology of tomorrow. And they also say that drug discovery is a field that uh, will benefit most from uh, application of quantum computing. But so far, nobody has really figured out how, and the race is on for to uh, make an application of quantum computing in drug discovery. And um, I think uh, when the quantum computing becomes a practical method, in maybe it will take five to ten minutes, it will be a whole new different field. So uh, the future, let me just uh, uh, bravely uh, predict that the, of the, uh, the future of the computational drug discovery lies in the quantum computing. And that's, uh, you know, so far uh, the, what it seems to be but it may take uh, five to 10 years uh, for that to be realized as a reality. So uh, I talked about the past, present, and the future of um, uh, the computational drug, dis uh, drug discovery. But let me uh, finish my talk uh, uh, by bringing up something uh, related to the name of my company. But uh, it's, a, uh, it's a slide that I used for over the last 14 years or so. Uh, to start my talk as an uh, icebreaker. Well, in drug discovery, people talk about doing the experiments in in vivo, right? So that means that you, you're uh, using the animals. And now, if you do the experiments in a test tube, that's called in vitro uh, experiments. But starting in 1990s or so, uh, I, I did look up in Google for this part, and they says, uh, it said that uh, this term was originally used in 1989. And which, uh, this is in silico, uh, meaning that you are doing things on the computer. So really, uh, it means that you are uh, running the experiments on the silicon chips. Well, uh, that's nice, but it's, and it's been really popular to use the, uh, this term. But um, if you think about it, uh, it you know, running the computer uh, requires the programs and all different kinds of methods. And that's not a trivial thing. And in fact, you have to be really careful about what to use in terms of methods uh, or a combination of methods. And, and then so I uh, you know, figure that there has to be another uh, layer of thinking, which you call uh, in cerebral. Cerebral means uh, your brain, uh, basically. So uh, I'm just saying that uh, you should uh, think about the problem before you start, start it uh, start to run uh, uh, computer programs. So with that, um, uh, I'm going to uh, uh, stop my talk.
talk. Uh, and if you have any questions, I guess uh, uh, later on we'll have a panel discussion uh, at which time I'll be able to answer them. Thank you very much to, uh, for listening to my talk. Thank you. 네, 고맙습니다. 고려대학교 생명의 정보공학과의 교수이시죠? Yes, thank you very much, uh, Professor Archo, the professor at Korea University, also founder of Insubro, Sarah Brown. Uh, as mentioned by Professor, uh, I invite all of you who are watching on YouTube uh, to post your questions and comments on YouTube chat. So we will now move on to the third presentation of the second session. So in, in the era of digital transformation, what role would AI play in biomedical field? So the presenter is uh, Dr. Edwin Edison of AI Solution uh, Director of IQVIA. Hello and good afternoon. I'm Ed Addison, Director of AI Solution Delivery at IQVIA. I'm also chairman for Cloud Pharmaceuticals and a technology advisor for Pearl Ventures, all of which uh, work in the world of AI and healthcare. Today, I would like to talk to you about AI for drug discovery and development and how AI enhances the efficiency, speed, novelty of drug discovery and development, all while reducing its cost. The topics we'll cover today are that uh, AI is revolutionizing drug discovery. We'll look at repurposing. We'll also look at disease pathology, molecular design, AI for finding the right patients, biomarker identification, AI to predict technical and regulatory success, and a few key takeaways. This is rather uh, a broad agenda. My purpose is not to dive into all of the how-to in every one of these fields, but instead to talk about the what, what is being done. If you survey the AI for drug discovery and development landscape, you will find dozens of vendors out there, almost all of which have just a point solution. Only a few have gone beyond a point solution to cover the entire spectrum of drug discovery and development. IQVIA is one of those that has done that because of its broad history in clinical, regulatory, and uh, uh, CRO success. Uh, the company's most recent merger with uh, uh, IMS Healthcare has brought us the largest collection of data in the world in uh, AI drug discovery and development. So we know from the media and the literature that AI is revolutioning drug revolutionizing drug discovery and development. And here in this diagram, you can see some of the many ways that it's doing so. Uh, target identification, molecular optimization, predicting drug interactions, all of this occurs at the beginning of the discovery cycle. In the preclinical phase, you can add biomarker identification to that. Uh, emerging fields also include uh, toxicity and PK evaluation. Uh, as we move into the clinic, the uh, drug repurposing becomes a particularly strong application. Trial design, virtual trials, patient recruitment, identifying the right physicians, and predicting the probability of success of your program are all areas that machine learning has been successful at doing for one or more programs. The industry has faced some pretty significant challenges. These are that uh, the cost of developing a drug is a couple of billion dollars in 10 to 15 years, and half of this time and capital is dedicated to clinical trials. Uh, the approval rate is less than 12%, and there's always this high uncertainty in R&D. So this leads to some specific industry needs that AI can solve uh, and has solved. We can avoid costly trials by repurposing existing drugs. IQV is pretty good at this. We've done this multiple times. 
we can use cheaper, faster design of new molecules. This makes preclinical and discovery more efficient, leaving more time on patent for your profit. That's the most significant gain that you, you get by applying AI to design and preclinical. You can predict the probability of success before incurring further costs. And this is particularly true in the clinic when you have the first proof of uh, principal data in humans in deciding whether to go to more expensive trials. And you can use it to identify the right patients. Let's start by talking about repurposing. Traditional drug development has this long 10 to 15 year cycle shown on the left beginning with discovery all the way to registration. If we are to use AI to do drug repurposing and do so successfully, we can shave off several of these steps, reducing the time to one to uh, three to uh, four to 10 years instead of 10 to 15 years. And that substantial savings results in greater revenue. Now let's talk about uh, drug target interaction and drug target discovery. We use high quality drug and protein patterns to improve target interaction predictions and also to identify and discover targets. We use natural language extraction also to identify targets and then can apply that to our drug target uh, interaction studies, which result, uh, which apply web-based information source drug and target structure, uh, substrate decomposition, and AI machine learning modeling to result in improved drug target interaction profiles. Our approach to repurposing new drugs is based upon multiple data sets ranging from text, genetics, omics, phenotype, assay, molecular structure. One of the things that IQVIA is particularly strong at is depth of data and the ability to access big data and disparate data types and bring it together in a machine learning problem. For example, our probability of success prediction uh, project, uh, Victoria, which you'll hear about a little bit later, uses 1,800 independent variables. That takes a lot of data. Our applications are either drug-centric or disease-centric. Either way, we can look to repurpose a drug or we can look to find an existing drug for a disease, benefiting a speed up uh, development, uh, a speed up of our development process, saving time and money, increasing the probability of clinical trial success, providing earlier patient access and bypass 80% of preclinical failure rate, bypass a lot of the clinical toxicity failure rate because these drugs have already been approved and it in, does bypass some of the efficacy failure rates because these drugs have already been approved for other, other indications. Let's look at how we can understand disease with GWAS and AI. GWAS, genome-wide association studies, combined with genomics data, can drive our understanding of disease pathobiology. What we do is we compare genomic data and identify disease pathways. Uh, we also have natural language extraction tools through linguamatics to pull pathways out of the literature, and we can correlate them and match them with populations. We can compare to known disease pathways to identify other potential disease candidates, and that results in disease candidate list for uh, investigation with supporting genomic evidence. This is a very sophisticated and cutting edge program and is very useful if you want to accelerate your drug discovery through re, either through repurposing or for the identification of novel targets or the identification of mechanism of action for, uh, for your drug program. Let's talk about the application of AI to molecular design and optimization. Traditional methods of discovery or use exhaustive searches of fixed libraries, resulting in weak hits that have to be optimized by chemists. Using generative models for molecular design, we can result in hand-specific mutation rules not being necessary 
and get new compounds generated automatically by modifying a vector representation and decoding. A diagram for this method is shown on the next page with the goal being to design molecules, current approaches to model lead optimization as a machine learning problem. The training data involves paired molecules that map out molecule X to target Y with more desirable properties. We use generative adversarial learning with, uh, with historical information to allow us to do this with greater depth on uh, less amount of data. As you know, there's, there's no deep data set. There's always, there's always a deeper data set and that they don't exist and they're expensive to access. So often we have what our customer has, what we have and what's available in the published literature and by using generative adversarial networks, we're able to achieve results that we couldn't achieve by doing just straight deep learning, which requires a much denser data set. The graph generation methods that come out of this uh, uh, exhibit um, uh, undesirable behaviors. And so that's why we use the machine learning approach instead of the graph generation techniques that have preceded this. Let's talk about finding patients now. We're finished preclinical, we're going into the clinic. One of the bottlenecks of the clinic is finding patients. So R&D and rare diseases, specialization of treatments and precision patient targeting increase the need for finding the right patients. These are trends that are occurring in the market today and finding the right patients becomes absolutely critical. The current situation in the industry is that patient populations are known to be fairly heterogeneous. Biomarkers help characterize and reduce the patient heterogeneity. About 20% of the drugs approved by the FDA were associated with biomarkers in recent years, such as clinical genetic uh, demographic biomarkers. There are other applications of biomarkers, prognostication and predictive markers, and we can apply all of these AI-assisted biomarker identification methods to, to achieve all of these different kinds of biomarkers from the large degree of data that we have for biomarker identification. Here's how we do it. Biomarker identification, first of all, the reason it's important is that drug makers are no longer, um, are, are taking longer to, uh, to move medicines to approval and novel biomarkers and the ability to draw from pre-screen patient pools provide a productivity boost to a faltering R&D industry. Genetic testing leads to a greater understanding of biomarkers linked to disease. Our solution combines, uh, uses a combination of data types, text, omics, phenotype, assay, molecular structure. They're all utilized in cell-centric learning models to aid the patient stratification and disease progression with our machine learning based biomarker identification model. The, the valuable IP that results from this is a response biomarker, a predictive biomarker, or biomarker frequency for safety, and uh, make, make uh, your projects queryable for specific models. Now let's talk about AI to predict technical and regulatory success. This is a really big push at IQVIA. We have lots of data, lots of experience in this. Not only helps investment decisions, but it also in uh, studio design and better understanding of features uh, and the impact on a success model. So a user of our pipeline prediction technology can predict the probability of technical and regulatory success. We call that PTRS. We can search for existing trials. We can predict the probability of trial success. We call that PTS. You can maximize the value of your portfolio by applying AI technology at every stage of the drug discovery and development cycle from optimizing clinical trial designs to making more informed decisions, gaining competitive intelligence, uh, or providing support to your portfolio valuation. We can provide the data sources that provide best in class and first in class medicines. We bring them all together 
and we apply machine learning at every phase in the drug development and um, uh, and discovery and development cycle. We are especially good at predicting the probability of success at a clinical trial based upon your initial proof of concept data plus hundreds of other data sources. We have 18,000 variables, 20 years of clinical trials. Um, we build the data set, we train the model, and we predict with confidence, and our confidence levels have approached 0.87 or 87% in terms of its accuracy. So a few key takeaways from today's message. Um, AI and machine learning in clinical R&D is proving, providing a paradigm shift around speed, accuracy, and cost. Our DTI for drug repurposing shortens development timelines, provides earlier patient access, improves the like likelihood of clinical trial success, and expedites the development of existing marketed and abandoned development drugs for repurposing and repositioning. So find more, uh, find more revenue for those existing drugs, find more success for those drugs that might fail for an entire population, uh, but could pass for a smaller population. Our molecular design approaches enable greater productivity and shorter timelines. Shorter timelines means more time on patent. More time on patent means greater ROI for all of your drug programs. Our primary objective of applying uh, AI in the uh, preclinical space for both molecular design, target discovery, biomarker discovery, uh, evaluation of tox and or uh, uh, bioavailability, all center around one goal and that is besides increasing novelty, decreasing the time that it takes to get you to the clinic. The shorter you could take to go to the clinic, the more revenue that you get because of more time on patent. Uh, this became especially clear during the pandemic when we saw rapid successes with AI in vaccines and drug repurposing due to COVID-19. Our machine learning platform algorithms identify predictive biomarkers and treatment populations with strong outcomes based on a pre-screened patient pools that will drive optimization of trial success. So we can optimize both the trial success through the application of AI, as well as better protocol design and confidence for pharmaceutical companies around where to invest and your budget for the biggest value for return. Thank you for your time today. I will be in the panel. I look forward to your questions. If you were unable to reach me on the panel or you would like to follow up directly with me, I'm providing an email address here, edwin.addisonicubia.com. Your email will be returned with specific information about uh, our offerings or about AI and drug discovery in general, of which we're very knowledgeable. And if we come to understand your problem, then we can bring the right people to you to discuss it at greater length. I look forward to talking with you. Thank you very much. 네, 고맙습니다. AI 기반의 신약 개발 주제로 발표했습니다. Move on to the fourth presentation of session two. The project manager, Gregor Kemper, of Biotechnology from Germany Trade and Invest, will talk about trends in pharma and biotech industry, a European perspective. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Today, we will talk about the future of drug and biotech companies. I work in the European Drug and Biotech Commission. I work in the European Drug and Biotech Commission. I work in the European Drug and Biotech Commission.
biotechnology a product manager group. Uh, introduction to the German biotech and pharma industry tree, uh, based mostly on data and uh, some statistics on uh, current developments in the pharma industry. And then I'd like to talk about current trends, um, impact of the, the pandemic, what of it is going to last, and which topics are going to be of importance for the uh, pharma and biotech industry probably in the next years. And finally, since a part of the topic of today's event is digitization, I'd like to talk about um, digitization in life science in pharmaceutical and biotech research uh, and show some examples of German companies that are active in these spaces. Well, first about the German biotech and pharma industry. The biotech industry is, as you all know, an industry that is growing globally um, and Germany being no ex ex exception here. Also a large part of the revenue is reinvested into research and development. This also has been uh, increasing over the past year. Financing, there has been an upward trend in financing for biotech companies. I will say a bit more on, on this aspect later. There are a bit over uh, 800 companies in the biotech space in Germany and over 50,000 people work in this area with uh, an annual growth of about 7%, so pretty steadily increasing. Now, Germany is the largest pharmaceutical market of the European Union, and it's not only a large one, it's also a very dynamic one. Here you can see that according to data from uh, IQVI in 2019, the German pharmaceuticals market uh, exhibited the highest growth rates of the larger countries of the European Union. But Germany is not only an important pharma market, but also a really important pharmaceutical R and key uh, location. Here you can see uh, data of the European Association of the Pharmaceutical Industry showing the development of R and D, drug development, uh, pharmaceuticals research expenses in the past decades. And you can see that Germany is actually one of the few countries where this figure has been going up in the last decade. Now, what does this uh, biotechnology and pharma uh, re research ecosystem look like? An important aspect of it are biotechnology clusters. You might know that politically, Germany is a quite decentralized country, and this also applies to the biotech R&D landscape. You have a relatively high number, over 30 uh, different biotechnology countries distributed all over the uh, clusters, distributed all over the country. Uh, and some of them are basically physical clusters operating uh, biotechnology parks, uh, general technology parks that provide lab and office space, which is especially relevant for startups that want to grow their business flexibly. Um, they also uh, perform translational research and connect academics to industry, helping to bring um, research results to practice to, uh, into the biotechnological industry. And they also often create a community basically for their members, for players of the biotech industry to exchange. And some of them are dedicated to individual research foci, individual research topics such as infectious diseases or nanotechnology. Now, what are the current um, events that uh, affect the German biotech and pharma world at the moment and perhaps also in the coming years? Well, the elephant in the room is of course the COVID-19 pandemic. And one important uh, impact it had was partnerships. Well, of course, partnerships in the biotech and pharma world and in drug development have already been paramount before the start of the pandemic, but I think COVID-19 has brought this to an entirely new level. For example, BioNTech, who, you know, because they developed an mRNA COVID-19 vaccine together with Pfizer, signed a total of 1,200 contracts with 150 partners uh, in order to um, develop and uh, manufacture this mRNA vaccine. And this is just one of the examples uh, of how partnerships grew quantitatively, but also qualitatively. I keep hearing that collaboration across competition is getting more common. There are uh, stories of great flexibility, such as that of uh, IDT Biologica, a German manufacturer that was actually scheduled to manufacture a dengue fever vaccine for um, Takeda Pharmaceuticals, but came to um, uh, an agreement with all involved parties to postpone this and prioritize the production of um, COVID-19 vaccine for J&J. &J. Another important aspect is public investment. The German federal government invested 750 million euro alone in the top three German vaccine developers, 
COVID-19 vaccine developers uh, in order to accelerate their late stage clinical research and production ramp up. And finally, the therapeutic area of um, infectious diseases, which was not the most popular one in drug development, I suppose, uh, before the pandemic has received way more attention. And uh, last year, the pipeline of infectious drugs developed by companies that are active in, in Germany increased by a total of 30%. So this made it the second biggest therapeutic area after oncology in Germany. And uh, this, although about a third or a large part of these, um, of these new drugs were, of course, against COVID-19, not all of them were. And this might show that uh, now the field has received some more attention. However, I think the biggest change uh, of brought about for the biotech world by the pandemic was the increase in funding for biotechs. In Germany, they accre increased in 2020 by a, a full 260%. And now the big question is how much of this is a one-time effect, how much of it is going to last? Nobody knows this for sure, but what we do know is that in 2020, 68% of the biotech financing were IPOs, the largest share of which were the IPOs of the two mRNA developers, PureVac and BioNTech. But on the other hand, this means that almost a third of uh, the, the financing that flew in 2020 were non-IPO uh, revenues such as uh, venture capital. And this increase in venture capital may be a hint that uh, this is actually a, a long-term effect and that at least a part of it, it might be going to last over the past years. Now, as I said, I'm going to talk a bit about uh, digitization in, in life science. So not in the healthcare itself, but in the uh, uh, life science R&D. And show a few examples. One of them is automation, laboratory automation and robotics. Now, this is um, something that might help to free up uh, work time, uh, free up uh, professionals from doing manual tasks and dedicating their work time to something else or making experiments more reproducible by reducing human variability. Some projects in this space are GoodBot, the German company that uh, produces and develops a pipetting robot that uh, is rather small and therefore also practical for smaller labs, and the Laboratory Automation Network, which is an alliance of different companies that provide lab automation uh, solutions, which uh, teamed up in order to provide coherent solutions for their clients enabling them to not have individual solutions, but one overarching um, infrastructure. And this is one example of how uh, the experience that the German industry has with uh, manufacturing industry and engineering is actually also very beneficial for innovative developments in the life sciences field. Another important point is data. Uh, in Germany, there has been in 2020 an application which enables patients to uh, donate their data for uh, medical research in, in COVID-19 in order to accelerate the detection of COVID-19 outbreaks. And within just about a month, half a million of people have donated their data. So this shows that there is, are actually um, quite a lot of people in Germany who would be motivated. According to a survey, 79% uh, of Germans uh, would be ready to give to donate their medical data for uh, medical research purposes. Now about the, uh, the European data infrastructure, there's an, an initiative called Gaia-X, which is an international European Union level uh, decentralized data infrastructure. And this infrastructure, of course, also holds great promise for the development of uh, medical innovation. For example, in Germany, the Berlin Institute of Health and the German Cancer Research Center are running a research project to um, use cloud-based data uh, for oncology. The final point I'd like to make is digitization and uh, AI in drug development. Many people hope that the use of AI might, for example, facilitate uh, drug discovery by uh, helping biotech companies to uh, predict the properties of compounds rather than screening through large libraries. And the EU is actually quite leading internationally in terms of regulation for AI in medical applications. And some examples for this, for AI uh, use in the pharmaceutical industry is the Cynthia software by Merck, which is made for retrosynthesis. 
and the collaboration between Sartorius and the German Research Center for Artificial Intelligence on AI in bioprojection. Now, there are also some other minor points like um, the digital package information leaflet, which I'm not going to go into detail right here because uh, in the interest of time. Now, final, my final point is how can you become a part of this ecosystem? Well, Germany Trade and Invest uh, provides information and support for international companies that are interested in expanding to Germany. We provide a variety of um, industry-specific but also cross-sectional information to make this step to a foreign country easier. We also have um, offices pretty much all over the world, including one in Seoul, where you can get in touch with my colleague, Mr. Frank Robeschek, or you can just contact me directly. Thank you very much for your attention today, and I'd be happy to meet you in Germany. Goodbye. 네, 그레고르 캠퍼 전문 위원님의 yes, uh, thank you, uh, project manager Gregor Kemper for your presentation. So uh, we have reached the panel discussion session for the second session of today's program. Uh, when the panelists are ready, uh, we will now invite. We will soon invite the moderator and the panelists. We will have one moderator and two panelists. So we will now invite them to the stage. So, uh, the founder and CEO of Bridget Biotherapeutics, uh, Mr. chung Yu Lee, will be the moderator of the panel discussion. And we will have uh, Dr. Yong Jin So and Dr. Yung Song Cho. Uh, and uh, Mr. Lee, yeah, the moderator, will be uh, with uh, Edison, uh, Dr. Edwin Edison will be with us online. So I'm James Lee, uh, the current CEO of Bridge Bio. I'm really glad to uh, run this. Uh, Thank you. Uh, with, uh, really uh, great uh, speakers, including uh, Youngjin and Art and Ed uh, from remote. Uh, uh, topic is really uh, interesting: uh, digital transformation and biotech and healthcare. Uh, those three uh, keywords are really, really uh, uh, can say stimulating to me because the digital transformation. Transformation actually is a really broad and big concept, and which can impact every corner of industry. Uh, industry, uh, not only in biotech and health, but also all other industries as well. Uh, uh, from the presentation, uh, Ed uh, uh, really, sh really, very showcased how AI technology can impact on every corner of drug discovery, all the way to regulatory uh, approval. Uh, here's one question to add. So you mentioned a couple of, uh, couple of uh, services uh, which uh, IQVIA is now providing by using AI. So among them, uh, there was uh, discovery-related uh, services and drug re repurposing and development-related uh, services. Among them, which are most, uh, most popular uh, from your sponsor in terms of case, in terms of number of cases? Which is the most popular? Well, that's a very good question. Um, <laughs> our history, you know, before Acuvia became Acuvia, it was uh, Quintiles merging with IMS Health. Right. And that merger uh, increased our access to data and then increased our emphasis on data science and AI. But the application that seems to go the fastest Mm -hmm. And in the highest volume is the predicting the success of clinical trials. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason for that is because of our deeper history in that part of the uh, drug development process. Right. I see. The uh, work and discovery uh, is younger at uh, IQVIA mm -hmm. than the work in the clinical side. Uh, but we have uh, a large group, mm -hmm. 30 people. And we've done quite a number of projects. I see, I see. So because of the uh, origin of IQVIA, you said, uh, most of the services, uh, uh, clinical trial related uh, services, uh, it's really, really so quite predictable. But do you see increasing number of uh, cli uh, clients approaching you 
to use your AI uh, services in drug discovery and drug repurposing? Um, we do. I mean, there's, uh, we have a large brand, mm -hmm. and that brand has a halo effect. So right. even though we began in the clinical space, as we expand, um, the, the, we're, we're a widely, widely known company. And so that is, uh, that is uh, uh, very helpful in terms of uh, getting started quicker mm -hmm. than, say, a startup company would uh, in the preclinical space. I see. I see. Great. Yeah, uh, uh, it could be really a uh, really huge brand, uh, which most of the drug uh, development person already know. So the brand uh, really tells a lot about your services. Thank you. And here's Thank a question you. to uh, uh, Young Jin. So most of the biotech company uh, founders and entrepreneurs and executives are really focusing on technology. But you try to uh, uh, redirect the, uh, their attention not only to technology but also to business strategy. So uh, I, I really, uh, uh, your point really uh, resonated with me. And so here's the question. So when do you think is the right timing uh, the uh, executives uh, should discuss uh, in terms of series A, B, C, or uh, around the IPO or after IPO in Korean context. The 질문이 과연 business uh, 전략을 사업 전략을 심도 깊게 이야기하고 그것에 대해서 이제 고려해서 좀 짜야 되는 시점이. When do we need to have the commercial strategy? We have a series A, B, C, D series of funding. And when is the right timing for us to think of the overall strategies? Let me answer the question in Korean. In reality, based on my experience before and after the series B, is the right time for you to think of the, of the commercial, commercialization strategy. Actually, you have to think about it before you begin your company. However, reflecting the reality, Series B or the other step, when you get the more than 10 billion won of investment, you have to think of the business strategies or commercialization and technology transfer strategies as well. So once you get the investment of about 10 billion, you do not, you should not delay thinking of the commercialization anymore. Youngjin answered me with this. At least around the series B, the executive should think about how how to develop their company in the in the long term meaning uh, uh, when they uh, should license out their compounds or until when they should develop their compounds by themselves. Okay. Yeah, good. good point. That historically, most of biotech companies consider licensing out as the key milestone of their success. Uh, beyond that, they, didn't, uh, they haven't think a lot as uh, much. But from now, I think that we should uh, think about when to license out or up until uh, uh, when, uh, uh, up until we should develop by ourselves. Yeah. Uh, Art, uh, your name uh, 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 tells a lot about the, uh, about, about the uh, AI. Because, okay. uh, uh, I think Art, uh, AI uh, technologies in some sense have some artistic uh, element because, <laughs> okay. uh, because we should feed the data uh, basically very well, well uh, clean the data set. Right. But the uh, thing is that we don't know how AI thinks. Mm -hmm. like we feed data, we get results, but we don't know how a actually machine thinks. Right, right. Uh, uh, are there any way to uh, uh, hack their uh, AI machine? Oh, that's and a good question. I'm, I'm not a real expert, but I heard from an expert that um, uh, there are, in fact, uh, research that's going on uh, for deep learning that the Although uh, at the moment the deep learning uh, is uh, it, it tries to find out uh, the, the patterns behind the data mm -hmm. without uh, you know, explicitly stating what it is, 
but uh, apparently there is a way to track down uh, what uh, what the data are doing within these layers of uh, mm -hmm. the learning processes. So mm -hmm. uh, apparently, I, I, I think um, uh, probably in the very near future, we uh, might have this um, uh, deep learning uh, version that uh, you can track down the, uh, what's happening behind the scene. I so see. then I guess uh, that will be, um, you know, uh, great advantage for right. people who use the AI technology, yes. Yeah, so I, I hope we, we, can, we can see how they think. Yeah, of yeah. course, but, but then again, then, then you know, that's uh, gonna be too simple, right? I mean, you, you wanna <laughs> be a mysterious uh, being out there I that see. we call AI that they're helping the humankind, right? <laughs> yeah, another question about the comp your company in Cerebro. Yes. Mm -hmm. Most of uh, AI-based drug discovery company originally started as a service provider right. or a software uh, provider, but they naturally right. uh, uh, are evolving or have evolved mm -hmm. to drug discovery or drug development right. company. So what's your plan for your company? Well, I mean, um, initially, uh, we, we, um, right from the start, we, uh, th we uh, label us uh, as like a biotech company, meaning that they we're actually developing uh, drug uh, candidates uh, uh, for s specific targets that we choose. But now, uh, the reason that uh, although we have our own methodologies and our own platform, mm -hmm. we develop them, um, you know, uh, for uh, with all our might. But uh, the the reason that the, we set out to do, uh, you know, the drug discovery ourselves is because the providing the platform itself mm -hmm. will actually take a lot more workforce. Mm -hmm. Like uh, in case of Schrodinger, for example, they have uh, a lot of people who work on UIs. Uh, because, you know, uh, if you want to provide this pl platform or programs to uh, other firms, you want to make them usable. I mean, uh, that, that takes a lot more of uh, the labor uh, than just doing the discovery uh, yourself. So uh, in our yes. case, um, we, we're going to uh, develop uh, the, this, the methodologies of mm -hmm. our own, and that will be unique, and, you know, yes. it will uh, be... Well, in, uh, we hope it will uh, be different mm -hmm. and uh, better than others, mm -hmm. but uh, our main goal is to actually develop the drug candidates rather than uh, supplying uh, our services to other firms. That is not to say we don't do that. I mean, it's a, a part of our business model to mm -hmm. collaborate with other firms where we uh, provide our uh, yeah. technology. Okay, great. The last question uh, is actually uh, to add. Uh, so as you know, the Korea has a really uh, interesting healthcare, uh, healthcare providing uh, system in Korea, meaning that we have on a very large uh, government-run insurance system, which covers almost all of the population, Korean population, and collect every aspect of uh, medical data from from the birth to death. So, uh, from AI uh, expert. Uh, what would be a possible some kind of collaboration with uh, IQVIA or any any AI expert with the Korean government, which has a very large, large and very clean uh, data set in terms of the medical data? Well, uh, we'd certainly be del delighted to try to work with your data set. Um, our uh, AI works on lots of data. Uh, we have clinical trials data. We have uh, uh, and that, that comes from the history of um, quintiles. And then we have medical records and claims data, which came from the history of IMS Health. Mm -hmm. And we have genomics data from our uh, Q-squared uh, laboratory work. Uh, and of course, we have to negotiate for the rights from the clients, depending mm -hmm. on the particular uh, project. So, so if there is um, an opportunity to use your data and to try it on um, uh, different uh, aspects, different AI mm -hmm. solutions, uh, we could uh, engage in a conversation uh, with you. Mm -hmm. uh, normally, uh, we, um, you know, unlike a startup company, we don't take any ownership in any drug development. Right. Or, uh, strictly a service agent. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you're talking about a particular um, 
uh, drug development project. Uh, our collaborations don't involve risk sharing. Uh, we leave the ownership of the drug with the client. Mm -hmm. In the case of working with the government, it may, may be less focused on a drug development program and more mm -hmm. uh, interesting to you to learn what your data can do. And depending on what the policies are for who you make that data available to, uh, our AI services could be value-added services to those people. Yeah, I, I really uh, recommend you to contact uh, Seoul Metropolitan Government or Korean Central Government to, uh, to explore any possibility, uh, collaboration possibility by fully using Korean uh, medical data for uh, uh, virtually all the, all the population. Okay, so, uh, so uh, uh, as time uh, time is up, uh, let me uh, let me wrap up uh, this panel discussion. Uh, digital transformation is, uh, I think, it's I inevitable uh, in every sector and every every uh, industries. And here's uh, from IQBA and from uh, Genome and Company, and also from uh, Incerebro, we have seen how. Uh, 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 executives or thought leaders are thinking about the transformation, digital transformation. And I hope uh, those trans uh, digital transformation really uh, happen uh, in uh, Seoul metropolitan uh, government as well. Thank you, uh, speakers, and uh, especially uh, Ed from, um, from uh, West Coast. No, it's actually the East Coast, so oh, it's 1.40 a.m. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thanks for joining at, okay. uh, at night. Yeah. Okay. I'm used ja. to working around the clock. Ja. Thank you. So with this, we will conclude the panel discussion. Yeah. Thank you very much.